Hey, I'm Steve Leahy and welcome to Createx. Uh, I spent a little bit of time working on the end of this painting, which is uh, Home of the Free. Um, spent a little bit of time going over how I break the rules with Createx paint. Uh, the paint's fantastic. It's designed to work exactly how they intend, but sometimes we take things into our own hands and push things a little bit differently. So in this video, we're going to show you how I used Createx with a paintbrush and uh, also with airbrush and how I blend those two together. We'll finish this off and um, we'll clear it and um, we'll show you how this works. So let's get going. So here's the painting. Um, it's five by seven and I've done a lot of it already. Um, what I thought we'd do today is we kind of finish this painting up. Um, what I'm going to do is I'll show you kind of how I got to this spot, uh, some of the breaking of the rules to get this stuff to work the way that, that I like it to work, uh, and you know, kind of the techniques that I use to really get the small stuff locked in. Um, this panel is an ampersand panel, so it's a wooden panel, and the board that I'm working on has a metal sheet across, galvanized sheet. So I just put magnets on it to kind of allow me to kind of position this thing wherever I want. And it's also nice because I can have my tools nearby and they can also kind of hang on magnets as well. So this is an ampersand panel. It's an eighth of an inch thick wooden panel that's prepared and ready to go. And the way this started out was the panel is completely um, gessoed and all ready to go. It's, uh, um, it's, it's set up to be painted on right out of the gate. And uh, what I do is there's a couple different ways that you can transfer an image onto the surface. What I found was when I'm working real small, it's difficult to get an image kind of transferred correctly. There are a number of different ways that we've always done it with um, Sorrel paper or projectors, things like that. But with a real small surface, I found it was tough to get things accurately kind of placed. So what I started doing on the small panels is I would make photocopies of my reference photo, and then I would use that to cut out the different shapes. And that's kind of what I used to lay this out. Now normally that's the way it happens. With this painting, it was a little bit different. I leaned on my friends at HD Stencil, and what you can do is they'll create this super high definition stencil for you. And you supply them with the photograph that you're using, and then they'll give you back and this kind of I want to say it's screen printed, but it's really not. But that's the closest thing I can kind of relate it to. And it's super high detail. So what this gives you, it allows you to place this over your panel that you're working on, or whatever you're working on, spray through it really lightly with, say, a color like black. And then what you get is, I'll show you this painting here, is this kind of halftone newsprint type um, image of, of whatever the photo is. So it takes that transfer and makes it just really easy. Um, it's very high detail, but it's not to the point of you could just spray it and then call it done. It's really just a guide. So after that was done, ended up using the photocopies to block this in. So you'll notice the parts we'll be working on today are the crankcase and the air cleaners are the two parts that I need to finish to really finish up this painting. All the other chrome parts of this have been done, uh, but the techniques that I'm going to show you on these two pieces are what I used on all of the chrome, so you get a good idea of how that all works. So the first thing I do after it's transferred onto the panel is I use one of these photocopies to start blocking it in. And you can see on this one I've used this for the blue and this is basically in the chrome. This is the reflection of the sky in the top of the chrome. So I'll pick just kind of a kind of a middle of the road blue, like somewhere in between the final blue color so that way I can lighten it a little bit or darken it a little bit as needed or add whatever I really want to. So it really acts as like a blocking in type of thing. Uh, so that's what I did here to get all the blue and all the, all the chrome sections. And then I did the same thing with the ground color. So there's a ground color that I used for all, the, all the, the asphalt here. So that base color that I used for the background here is what I used to block in all these different areas. And that's kind of where we're at right now. So from here, it's going to be just kind of getting the details in and airbrushing and just kind of pulling it all together to get those details put together. Okay, so the top and the bottom are all blocked in. One thing I also did was, if you notice the black areas here where the 103, the label is, and some of the shadows. The first thing I do after I get them blocked in is I go in with black and I, uh, and I just kind of lock in all the darkest areas. 
and that's, that's where I started. Now the top section up here is actually me taking the photograph, <laughs> which is kind of cool. Usually I take that out, uh, but this time I left myself in th the shot, so I kind of appear in different spots in, in the chrome which is fun. But that's the fun about artistic license. You know, generally, if I want to make this look more like a showroom picture, I'll take out all those little extra highlights and, and details, like in this, we'll get to it, but there's a building in the background and some trees and that kind of thing. So I would normally take all that out, but in this painting, I left it all in. Um, one quick thing about this as I go along, um, the tank was a little bit different and it's worth, worth kind of going into how I did that. Um, the nice thing about doing these paintings are I can really get this painting painted like the actual motorcycle. So the tank, for instance, was originally the base color instead of being a blue, which you would think it was, was the Quicksilver Chrome. So I sprayed the whole tank with the Quicksilver Chrome and then candied on top of that to get that blue color. So when this is cleared, that tank is going to really shine like the actual actual motorcycle tank and that's nice it's something you really can't do except with paint so it's really good from there um, once I had the blue all locked in and the candy was on and everything was ready to go I hit that just the tank with a uh, uh, bleed checker 4040 and that really locked in all the blue colors so I could go and put in the yellow flames on top of that now all that was done with the same method of photocopies which you'll see how how I kind of get that done but all the flames and everything were just cut out of the, uh, the photocopy to get that kind of yellow in and then it was cleaned up a little bit. So there's no adhesive mask on this at all um, as I'm working. All right, so let's get started on this. So what I start doing basically is I'll start looking at some of these really tight details and there are two things that I'll start doing with it. First, I'll use the airbrush to kind of blend a lot of this area and then the balances with the paintbrush to really get these really, really tight details in. So we're going to start with the paintbrush to kind of lock in a few. For paintbrushes, I generally use just one type of brush. It's a watercolor brush by Winsor & Newton and it's a Series 7 paintbrush. Um, it's interesting. Th this whole video is about breaking rules and working with Createx with paintbrushes is not what they recommend doing. It's not intended to be done. Um, so it's one of those rule breaking things that you have to kind of wrap your head around when you're getting into it. Um, it's a, an acrylic based paint so uh, you can definitely use paintbrushes with it. However, when you start getting into it, if you use an acrylic brush like this one here, it generally will have natural or uh, synthetic bristles on it, like this one. And this is just an inexpensive craft brush, but it's a good example of an acrylic brush. And uh, the acrylic paints don't tend to soak into these bristles, so they, it makes them a really popular brush for doing you know, most acrylic painting. For doing this type of work though, where we're really tight and really fine, the natural bristled brushes work much better. So that's what these are. Both of these brushes are the same, they're just different sizes. One is a size zero and the other is a size double zero. And I use them both interchangeably. Again, it's all about breaking rules. So the one thing you have to remember when you're dealing with brushes and Createx or any kind of water-based acrylic paints, they tend to dry very quickly. That's their, that's their job. So we have to kind of combat that when you're dealing with paint brushing. So what we find is bigger bellied brushes tend to work better with, with the Createx paint because the paint tends to want to not dry as fast if there's more of it on the brush. So it'll kind of hold the wet paint better. The smaller the brush gets, the more air you kind of get around that paint and the faster it dries. So even though I do really super tiny stuff, the Zero brush, which is um, a good sized brush, but it's not incredibly small, will produce a really tiny, tiny tight line. So that's kind of what, what we do. All right, for reducing it, with the brush, I still use the 4011, which is my go-to reducer across the entire line, including the paintbrush work. So that works out really well, that you're only really using the same reducers and the same paints and the same products. The other thing that I will introduce to the paintbrush work sometimes is the 4050. And the 4050 is nice because it, it's just like in the airbrush use, it adds a little bit of transparency to it. It also strengthens the paint. As you're going to see, we're going to really over reduce this paint more than really what they recommend. So this 4050, just as you, with the airbrushing, uh, when you're paint brushing, it adds that binder back in as you're super reducing it. So that, that really helps out a lot too. 
All right, so let us do some of this. So what I'm going to look at first are these really, really tight details. I've already got the blue and the, the, the asphalt locked in on both these parts, the crankcase and the air cleaner. So what I'm going to kind of do is I'm going to kind of work both sections at the same time. And this is generally how I do. I'll pick an area that's fairly decent size, not the entire image, but just a couple spots that are you know close to one another. And I'll kind of work them at the same time. It's really a limited palette for what this chrome is, so it's not like I have to really worry about mixing up colors that I'm only going to use once and then have to try to figure out how I did that later on. They're all pretty much the same image over and over again in each piece of the chrome. So there's the building, there's me, there's the sky and the asphalt, and we're all pretty much repeated throughout the whole image. All right, so what I'm going to do is I have... 4050 already kind of mixed, not mixed, it's just in this little squeeze bottle. I like these bottles because they, uh, they're easy to handle and they allow me to kind of like just pour out a little bit at a time. So I'm going to try this. Usually this palette is flat, but the amount of painting I'm doing, I, I can just work on this angled area, which will work out well. The paint won't drip off. And then for the 4011, I'm just going to use one of these small mixing cups and I'm just gonna put a little bit of the 4011 in there and that's gonna be my cup for reducer. So that'll be off the side, but you know, now know what that is. <clears throat> okay, these are brand new brushes, so they have sizing in them. So I'm gonna rinse that off real quick, off to the side again. So it's the sizing is just like the sizing that would be in kind of like a, like a t-shirt, a new t-shirt when you get it. They put the sizing in it to keep the bristles straight and, and uh, clean. But you can see the point on that brush is ridiculous. And this, these brushes, not only do they create this point, but they hold on to this point even with the, the abuse of the acrylics. And I say that because, they again, these brushes aren't intended as acrylic brushes. They're really atten intended as watercolor brushes but they hold up fantastically. So I get a lot, I usually I get over a year out of these anyway. So that works out really well. So we're gonna squeeze out a little bit of paint too. For the paint, for this almost this entire painting, the blue, except for the candy, and this is very difficult to see, sorry, because I love this color and I use it a lot. This is 0061, which is Detail Cobalt Blue. Um, I love this color. Um, I use the Detail Line and the uh, Wicked Line interchangeably. Uh, the only difference why I would grab one over another is really just the color itself. I love cobalt blue. I love the way that it thins out. I love the color it has. It's really a, a, a cool blue. Um, the phthalo blue for me is a little bit greener, so in, in skies it tends to look more tropical. So I use cobalt blue a lot. So that is the detail cobalt blue. So it's the same kind of thing. On the palette, I'll just put out a drop. And with the detail stuff, you don't have to put out a lot and it because what's going to happen is it's going to dry on the palette as well. So we don't want to put out a whole bunch of paint that's going to that's going to um, evaporate and dry and just a waste of paint. For the white, it's the 0030, which is the Createx new Wicked White, opaque white. And this has become my go to white across the board, whether I'm airbrushing or paint brushing. Uh, there isn't another white from them that I use. This, this stuff performs like crazy. Uh, and as I find as I'm going along, I'm adopting more of that opaque line because it's, it just works so well. So I'm going to put out a drop of that too. And just for fun, I'm going to put out the uh, Wicked Opaque Jet Black, which is 0031. And the same thing here. The Jet Black has replaced my use of all the other blacks. Uh, in the line. I just, I love it. It's, it's a warm black. It has kind of a brown cast to it, which is, uh, which really, really works well for me. All right, so we're going to start with the, uh, some of the details in the back. Uh, and what's going on here is there are a couple cars in the background. There's some trees. And um, I'll deal with the trees in a second because I didn't put out any green. Well, I'll put out some green. That might help too. For the green, uh, it's been Wicked Opaque Thalo Green. Again, I'm trying to adopt most of the Wicked line as my go-to palette only because the performance is fantastic on it and it's nice to use these colors as a base. Uh, we'll see how this angled palette works as these paints kind of drop into one another. 
All right, so let's mess with the trees first then, since I've already got it palleted into the brush. So I'm gonna need one more color. Again, as you could probably tell from this bottle, this is another one of my favorite colors, which is 0065, which is Detail Yellow Ochre. This is my go-to yellow, and I know this looks kind of brownish in the bottle, but you can see a little bit on the label um, how yellow this looks. When you thin this out, this is one of my favorite yellows. It's not really a primary yellow at all. It's just a really, really nice overall yellow. So I use a ton of this color. So I'll put a drop of that out too. All right. What I'm using here is just a paper palette. You can get these at any craft store. They really work well. And uh, in my studio, I use a, um, a glass palette. And I like that because what I can do is as the paint dries, because it does dry very quickly on the palette, um, as that dries, I can just scrape it off and just put out another drop. So uh, but for today, we're going to use this, this little palette here, this paper palette, which will work well. So what I did was, to get this kind of light green, I just used a little bit of opaque white, some yellow ochre, and then the thalo green. And that'll give me this kind of, um, that'll give me this kind of light green. So I've already got a base for the, for the trees in here. It's a dark base. And what I did with that was that was just thalo green. Uh, so with this lighter green, I'll just kind of go in and add the rest of the highlights on those trees. So the trees, I usually always do the trees the same way. And this is really tiny, so I know it's tough to see. Uh, but the trees, I always base them kind of the same way, which is a dark green underneath. And then I add the highlights on top of that. And there's some more trees on this side. But uh, I'll throw in the lighter green first. I'll kind of go against the rules there uh, because I didn't put the base green down first. So the base green, the way I'll do that on the other side is a little bit of phthalo green and then the detail cobalt blue. I'm going to add a little bit of 4050 to this too. So I've squeezed out a drop of 4050 as well. And this will help to keep it fluid a little bit longer. It's, uh, it's, it's perfect conditions in the spray booth. Um, so perfect conditions for uh, paint means it dries fast. So it's drying a little bit fast here, but, uh, but you can do a few things to kind of help that. Uh, stay open. And just like on the brush, if you have a, a bunch of paint together, it's going to dry a lot slower than when it's all palleted out here. So I try to keep on the palette, I try to keep the paint I'm using kind of bunched together. And that really helps to keep it from drying as fast as it normally would if I palette it all out. So with that darker green, I can go back in in these trees and just kind of throw them in like that. Yeah, those trees are pretty big. Okay. All right. Now, down here, this, this paint that I had done, the lighter green, that's just about dry on the surface now. I can reactivate it, but I want, what I want to do is I don't want to, I don't want to keep reactivating the dried paint. Uh, it, what happens if you keep doing that, then it, it, it'll, basically you'll, you'll pull out its ability to really dry correctly. So it's better to mix up fresh paint than to keep reactivating dry paint, which you can. You can reactivate it a couple times uh, before it really like sets up on you. So we'll just throw those trees in there like that. And that'll be done. Okay, so a little bit more definition in those dark areas. So with that, it's the same combination. It's the, it's the blue, a little bit of the phthalo green, but this time I add a little bit of black to it, opaque black and that'll give me this real deep hunter green. So with that, I can add the final little shadows that are going on on those trees. So if I want this more transparent, I can palette this out and then add the 4050, which is also drying on the surface, which is another reason. That's the biggest reason I only put out a drop of paint. If you squeeze out a whole bunch of paint, you're gonna be wasting a lot of paint, it'll dry very quickly. So by adding the 4050, it'll turn this really dark green into a more transparent green. So I can add those real tight, tight details in the, in the real fine transition between the darker areas of these trees and the lighter areas of the trees. 
So the other thing too, since I've done a number of these areas all at different times, what I want to also kind of keep, in tra keep track of is where I did the trees in, in the other sections, I want to kind of make sure I match what's going on. I don't want one section to be really different than another. Uh, and sometimes, you know, it, it happens and it's always easy to kind of adjust it after. But if you can get it the first time, it's usually the way, the way it goes. Now since the 4050 also keeps this open a little bit longer, I can also blend on the surface a little bit easier when I have the 4050, so it'll act more like, I don't want to say oil paints because oil paints stay open a lot longer, but um, it acts more like an oil paint than it does an acrylic paint when you kind of get that 4050 mixed in as well. So you can blend on the surface a little bit easier. Uh, you can push it around a little bit. The thing to keep in mind with the 4050 though, once that dries on the surface, that is rock solid. That's not going anywhere. So if you're used to using the illustration colors, which has a longer open time as far as being able to rework it, adding 4050 to it takes that away. So you got to keep that in mind too. And that could be exactly what you want. It's just again, it's knowing the rules before you can break them. So for the added kind of highlights in the trees. I just took a little bit of white, some of the yellow ochre, and then I just kept the dirty brush kind of with the green in it, and I just kind of mixed it all together. It gave me a really light kind of green. I'm going to loosen this up a little bit with reducer, but again, I try as hard as I can not to reactivate that paint with reducer, because if, like I said, if you keep doing that, you end up having a, just a tremendously weak paint. Now, in a detail like this, where it's so tiny, and this will be completely clear coated in the end, that layer of weak paint uh, is not gonna make a difference. It's gonna be locked in so hard with, with the clear after, and either, even further applications of paint. Uh, you don't really have to worry about, you know, the, the, the lack of adhesion from over-reducing. And you, of course, you, you know, you wanna really follow that tech sheet as close as you can. Uh, and know those rules, but this, once you know them, that's what really helps you bend them. All right, and I did all that, and the same thing is going on up here. <laughs> so real quick, I'm just gonna lock that in on the top. There are, there are some trees down in the crankcase too, so I'll, I'll hit both of those at the same time. So again, I come in with a dark green first, which is that uh, the phthalo green and then a little bit of the uh, opaque black. So this tree, the trees and the reflections up here are really lit up bright, so I don't need a lot of this dark color. I just need enough so that I can get it started. And this here is a reflection of the, the bike, so there's no trees in there. But down on the crankcase, there is trees. There, all the trees are around here. So I'll just throw those in now. And again, this by doing two sections or three sections at once, um, you can kind of eliminate having them all look really, really different. A bit of green there, and I think that's all the trees we got. Yeah. Good. So it's the same thing. It's rinse and repeat from here. So I'll use the dirty brush with, the, with that dark green, and I'll just kind of pull it out on the palette with a little bit of white, and that'll lighten it up. And then I'll just use the yellow ochre to greenify it, essentially. So that'll be the next layer. So it's all, about, it's all about building these layers with these colors. You know, it's, the colors are designed to be really bright and clean out of the bottle. They're designed as a starting off point for you. Um, it's how you mix them which will add that reality to, to what you're working on. Uh, and, you know, occasionally, you know, we need the bottle, the paint straight out of the bottle, uh, especially with like graphics or like the flames and things like that. Uh, where it's just a real graphic color and you need it right out of the bottle, but in, in, the, in the painting where it's more of a natural type of setting, you find you'll, you'll mix a lot of these colors, so they really act as more of a jumping off point. All right, I think I'm gonna go with a little bit more yellow in this and a little bit more white. And just add those highlights in each one of the tree sections. And that is good. It's a little bit over here too. So I work from, just like in the regular painting, I work from back to front. So whatever's in the 
background is what I do first. So in, in, in essence, when I sprayed in the, the, uh, the ground and the sky, that was farthest back, even though you know, you're looking at the you know, reflection of it really here. But that was in the back, so everything gets painted from the back to the front. And the reason why is because this paint likes to cover itself. Uh, so it's nice to be able to paint the whole sky in and then paint the trees on top of that instead of painting all these details and then trying not to get overspray from the sky on it. So it's just kind of a conservation of, of, of things to get that to work. All right, so with that done, we're just going to move on to the other details, which are the, the cars that are in the background and um, the buildings that are going on here. Also, this blue will appear in the... Um, in the chrome as well, the reflection in the chrome. So I'm going to start with a little bit of the blue and a little bit of white. And that'll give me a real clean blue. And I'm going to start by basing in all the details that are in the background. So there, uh, there's a car here. And um, obviously, I'm, I mean, this, there's a, this is me actually standing here. So I'm going to put my jeans in here. Chrome is fun because half of it is trying to paint, you, you, you see what, your, 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 what the image is in the, in the chrome, the distorted image, and half of it is you're trying to stop yourself from, um, from identifying that and painting what you, what you, what, what's there. You, you really just want to paint what you see, but it's hard with chrome because I know that's me standing there, but I'm all distorted because of the way that the, 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 the air cleaner is. Uh, so I have to really just kind of take a step back and really just concentrate on what I'm looking at and forget that this is my leg here. It's really just a blue blob, so it's fun to get to get kind of wrestle with that as you go. All right, so the blue is good. I want to check down here to see if there's anything going on down in the crankcase, and there is a little bit, so I'll start throwing some of that in too. And it just helps tie it together. The points cover is um, is either engraved or it's a decal, and uh, it'll be fun because there's a lot of bright colors in that. Uh, so we'll get to that last. And again, you work from I work from back to front, so that will really um, that'll be the last thing I do. All right, so we'll get the blue and the reflection in the foot pad and the crash bar. You can see a little bit in the reflection here too. So any of that blue uh, kind of get locked in. So again, I, I work this paint like it's watercolors, not acrylics. And again, that's not the way that the paint was intended to be used. So it's nice to be able to break the rules, but again, you need to know those rules first before you can break them. This paint it would be normally really fragile. Like if I were to take a piece of tape and kind of put a piece of tape or masking on this, there's a good chance a lot of these finer details would pull up because it doesn't have the adhesion that the paint normally has when it's out of the bottle or reduced properly. So it's a matter of just kind of knowing that as you're working with it. And that'll help you kind of, again, bend those rules without, without breaking them. All right, so that's good for the blue, I think. A little bit of gray in here, too. So still, I have the dirty brush with the blue in it. I'm going to use that. Just grab a little bit of the white and a tiny bit of the black to make a gray. And that'll be the rest of this blocking in. So just like I blocked in the sky and the, and the uh, ground, I'm doing the same thing with, with the uh, details as well. I'm not really worried about the super fine details. Uh, I'm just kind of using these colors to kind of get the areas blocked in so that I can use the airbrush and, and then a little bit of paintbrush in the end to kind of pull it all together. So this gray will be the front side of my pant leg as it spins around. And this is skin tone because that's actually my arm. And I don't, I think this is, again, this is where you start playing games. You know, you start trying to figure out what you're looking at and in the end you just, it's sometimes better to just say, okay, that's a square block that's green and gray. <laughs> just go with that. All right. Good, I think that's pretty well blocked in. There's one part that's missing and the sky actually appears right here. So I'm gonna put that in too. Rinse out the brush and I'm gonna use that phthalo blue and a little bit of white, which is how I made the sky color in the first place. So I know it's gonna match, I just have to get the value right. It's pretty light, so I'm gonna add a lot of white. 
That should be good. This is probably going to be too light, but I'd rather be too light than too dark. It is too light, but that's okay. Because what I can do, let me just put this piece of sky in here. And since I'm here with this blue, there's sky reflecting on the little screw that holds the air cleaner in as well. So I'll throw that in as well. And just kind of checking around to see if I, I can use this anywhere else. Okay, that's good. So the sky is, I went too light. This is the extra sky color and this little wedge right here is supposed to be that same color. This is where the 4050 really helps out with this paintbrush work. What I can do is I can take the 4050, I'll make sure there's no green in it. There is, so I'm gonna put out another drop of 4050, which is okay because the 4050 was just about dried on the palette anyway. And again, it's so nice putting out a drop because then, um, because then you're not wasting it, really. I mean, it dries before you can use it. Let me get one more drop of that here. Here we go. That 4050 in that little bottle is straight out of the bottle, so it's full strength. I know I'm going to be reducing it as I go. So I put a little bit of the 4050, and then, oops, almost grabbed the wrong color. There we go. A little bit of the blue. And that's, yeah. And now I can take a, more of the 4050 and really make a transparent, version of that blue. I can even grab a little bit of reducer if I really want it to flow well. So I pallet that into the brush. And now the brush will essentially work a lot like an airbrush now. So I have a really thin layer or thin mix of that blue. So I can kind of wash over that blue, let that dry. You can blow on it a little bit just like you would when you're airbrushing. So once it's dry, you can put another layer of that. And as you add layers, it'll just keep getting darker and darker. Grab a little bit more of that. <clears throat> Gonna let that dry. You have to let it dry because if you don't, you'll just be dragging the paint around. So as you let it dry, you put the next layer on, it'll darken up. And each layer, I kind of check it against the top section until I get it where I want it. This, I might have added a little bit too much 4050. It's doing it, but it's moving really slow. It's, it's developing slow. So I'll add a little bit more blue to this to give it a little bit more guts. Should be able to get it to where it should be faster. Yeah, that's better. Again, let that dry. You can even use the airbrush to kind of dry it off. And if you look at it at an angle, you can see the wetness of the paint. So you just dry, you just dry it off with the airbrush. And once you have it dry, you can put another coat on. So you can do this in small areas. It, it's tough to do this in bigger areas because the brush tends to have brush strokes, as it should. But in small areas, it's easy to kind of adjust this. Now, I could also do this with the airbrush. I could put that same really thin 40-50 mix of blue in the airbrush and just spray over this till it's right. But this is such a small area. If I mix up that in the paintbrush, I'll end up not using half of it. So there we go. So that's good. So that brings it down to the same value as the sky. So that's all blocked in now. All right. So from there, let's put the darkest details in. 